cannot join us today, I'm, I'm recording the lecture from this moment on. Um, so today's topic, as I've, uh, as I've explained earlier, would be uh, to understand, but also hopefully problematize the very notion of forerunners of Zionism or precursors of Zionism. One of the, the questions uh, that, that, you know, automatically uh, the, a term like forerunner raises for a historian is whether we actually can see the genesis of Jewish nationalist ideas before we have an organization, before we have institutions, and even before the term Zionism itself was coined, because actually the word Zionism, Zionismus in German, has a very clear date of birth. It's the last decade of the 19th century. So it automatically would raise a question, to what extent one can talk, if at all, about someone we, we will see maybe in retrospect as advocating or promoting ideas that might seem Zionist to us, if he, and usually, unfortunately, these are male authors, he was operating in a surrounding and in a time in which the term Zionism what yet was not yet uh, included. Moreover, as you can see, that's hinted in the subtitle of today's session, uh, it, any discussion about those uh, so-called forerunners of Zionism brings to the forefront of our discussion a bigger question about the, ten, the tendencies, and if you'd like, some would argue tension between a very theological baggage that these thinkers, thinkers are bringing into the discussion, or maybe perhaps the essence, quote unquote, uh, of Zionism is exactly some sort of a secular revolution that tries to cut uh, itself away from older forms of Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, 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 um, 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 thinking. So I know it sounds very abstract. I hope that today's uh, uh, talk lecture would kind of a hope help you know unpacking it and explaining it and to put us in context and also to make sure that uh, uh, you are not um, um, uh, panicky about too many names and 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 dates. I would remind you that. Today's lecture, like all the lectures, is followed by these handouts, and I'm not necessarily asking you to remember, memorize names and dates. The, the, these, when I'm offering um, 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 this larger um, uh, chronology, it's simply to allow us to uh, to situate ourselves in a chronology that is related to the bigger questions. This that I already offered in our previous discussions about where to locate the rise of Jewish nationalism vis-a-vis -vis other forms of nationalism emerging in Europe. So if the previous lecture highlighted questions about Jewish history and how in Jewish history enlightenment and assimilation played out, and if you'd like, set the stage for Zionism. Now, if we're looking at Zionism vis-a-vis other European nationalist movements, you will see that nationalism, Zionism as an organization and as a movement that has its own organs is a very much a latecomer in historical terms. Um, these chronologies of nationalism or, or of course vary and change according to the criteria the historian is using in order to define uh, uh, nationalism. So there's a big debate whether the American War of Independence and uh, in, in mythical years like 1776, do they just uh, symbolize a, uh, a revolt against uh, Britain or actually the rise of a new nation in, uh, um, in the US? Uh, but most would argue that, for instance, the French Revolution and, of course, the Napoleonic Wars that followed it already uh, opened, if you'd like, the genie of nationalism. And while you had a very universalist, if you'd like, even uh, um, um, supranationalist or anti-nationalist element in Enlightenment ideas that perhaps uh, uh, animated the um, uh, the French revolutionaries uh, to begin with. By the time you have the Napoleonic Wars that are really 
in a way, the first world war of, uh, of modern times in which uh, uh, Napoleon uh, and his troops are conquering vast lands and, and then you have local revolts against the French occupation, you already see a very strong nationalist element emerging in many European lands in southern what we would call today Latin America, you will see Simon Bolivar operating and using uh, this combination of European enlightenment ideas and nationalist, uh, uh, national liberation ideas coupled together. And maybe one of the most romantic and well-known events is the Greek War of Independence. Anyone who studies uh, British English literature, for instance, and, nor and is familiar with the figure of Lord Byron, the famous romantic uh, poet that volunteered and joined the Greeks in their war of independence. Again, the Ottoman Turks they saw the modern Greeks as, fo as following the footsteps of the ancient Greeks and even died there. And then, uh, which added much to his myth, would be familiar with that kind of a combination of romanticism and, and, um, and national um, very important uh, date, uh, the next in our table is 1848, the so-called spring of nation, a terms that, term that we've mentioned uh, before, again, with the problematics of uh, the way it was applied in uh, our times to the uh, revolts in the Arab world, but it's not only something that is happening in German-speaking Central Euro European land. You will see revolts in Hungary, in Italy, uh, in Greater Poland, um, and so on and so forth. You will have multiple movements that will have the prefix young attached to him, young Italy, young Hungary, and so on, which are nationalist movement uh, movements uh, that are revolting against often monarchical rule of a foreign uh, um, uh, power uh, um, dominating these uh, areas. And 8048 acquired, if you'd like, a mythical air of this kind of a miraculous year of uh, pan-European revolts. And this is why this term uh, spring of nations uh, uh, captured in the imagination and, and survived to this day to many respects. And one of the thinkers we will discuss today, at least Moses Hess, uh, very much looked with admiration at this historical moment, not only in Germany, where he came from, but also uh, he was looking at Italy, at the thinkers of the Italian nationalist movement, Mazzini and others. And this is well, um, uh, it's encapsulated in the title of his book, Rome and uh, Jerusalem. Um, we will not discuss the Damascus affair in great detail today. It will appear in your readings and we will return to this uh, on our next meeting. But when you will see modern historians start, starting to talk about these forerunners or precursors of Zionism, people, figures like Moses Hess, um, uh, born 1812, died 1875. Um, Yuda uh, ben uh, Shalomo Chai uh, was born in the late 18th century, 1798, and died in uh, 1878. Or Tzvi Hirsch Kalishel, who's uh, the German speaking uh, forerunners of Zionism, uh, uh, that published his book in 1862. You can see that they are not, therefore, uh, uh, starting to advocate ideas that we will see as national, nationalists out of thin air because it comes from nowhere. They are situated in, uh, in a European state, in an in European environment in which this is far more than simply a, what sometimes is referred to as a zeitgeist. It's not simply something in the air. They are embedded in cultures and societies in which uh, uh, nationalist struggles are all in the air. And this is an important move of contextualization in which I am offering you to see them as European figures responding to the challenges of their time and not necessarily only as quote unquote Jewish thinkers that are simply deriving ideas about Jewish nationalism from within a tradition of Jewish thought, theology and philosophy. Um, again, it refers to my uh, 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 larger argument about how we need to situate Zionism in uh, a multiple context, not to see it only as part of Jewish 
history, but also as part of European history. I would not go into great detail of the second half of the table, the chronological table before you. Uh, you can see it in the 1816 that, that witnessed the unification of Italy through a war, the Polish nationalist revolt, and especially the intoxication and radicalization of politics in the Russian empire with the rise of uh, groups that are very militant. Today, we would call them terrorist groups like Zemlya i Volia, which means land and liberty, fighting the Tsar, trying to assassinate them. Uh, this would very much influence Jews residing in the Russian empire that would look uh, uh, look at, uh, at these uh, movements. Um, and uh, the second half, uh, and especially the last third of the 19th century, that witnesses the emergence of a modern uh, state that we call Germany in 1871 after the French defeat in the Franco-Persian War and the Congress of Berlin. Uh, you see that already Europe Central um, and, uh, um, and Western Europe is already very much uh, um, 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 swore is kind of a, uh, the waves of, of different types of nationalist movement already uh, pass through it. So the sudden emergence of a Zionist movement, a formal movement that calls itself Zionism in the very last years of the 19th century, 1897 is the first Zionist Congress uh, that we will discuss next in our next meeting. It, from a European perspective, this is really a latecomer. It's a late bloomer that comes uh, late in, uh, in the game. Um, any questions thus far, pl please feel free to pause me here. So I've, I've offered you this uh, uh, larger uh, chronology because I think this would be the best way to jump and speak briefly about the three, four key figures that would animate our discussion today, whose portrait you can see here, Rabbi Kalisher, Moses Hess, um, 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 uh, Yuda Alkali, Rabbi Alkali, uh, uh, and uh, I added to it this figure, enigmatic uh, East European figure by the name of Peretz Smolenskin or Piotr Smolenskin, depends on whether you want to use his Hebrew name or his Russian name. Um, and uh, the entire discussion today follows on the, uh, the uh, I would be using here the vocabulary and the term that I've introduced in our previous meeting, uh, the five key words uh, that accompany these, uh, the emergence of Zionism in the early 19th century, namely emancipation, Haskalah, assimilation, vis-a-vis -vis romanticism, and modern antisemitism. So let's try and pick them one, uh, one by one. And in a way, I've chosen to start our discussion with a figure like Peretz Molenskin, and especially with his very interesting um, article or speech on the Haskalah of Berlin, because he might offer us, if you'd like, some sort of a conceptual and historical bridge connecting our discussions about the Haskalah and, uh, um, and early Jewish nationalism. Peret Smolensky, to many, into a great degree, uh, can be characterized as a classic East European Maskil. If you remember uh, from my recorded lecture, I've emphasized the fact that there is a tension uh, between the uh, German-speaking first proponents of the Enlightenment, those who admired uh, um, Moses Mendelssohn and followed his footsteps, and those who came slightly later when ideas of Haskalah moved and started influencing other Jewish communities. And you have to remember again that the beating heart, or at least the masses of European Jewry at the time are not the ones that are enjoying the fruits of Haskalah emancipation in Western and Central Europe, but the ones that are caught in the pale of settlement in Eastern Europe. And you will see a very interesting phenomenon in which uh, the educated, the rising intelligentsia of Jews that are uh, in uh, Eastern Europe start their, uh, uh, their careers admiring the German Jewish Haskalah. For instance, one of the most popular 
genres of literature at the time was popular biographies of Moses Mendelssohn. Jews in Eastern Europe admired them and their multiple biographies of these kinds that were uh, produced and disseminated among uh, the proponents of the Russian East European Haskalah. And Smolensky definitely started his career in that uh, 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 in that trajectory. But part of what you can start seeing when he is uh, maturing is a more ambivalent and if you'd like even critical approach toward, uh, toward the Haskalah and, uh, um, and what it symbolizes. And this is why the concepts of assimilation uh, um, and even I would even add maybe authenticity play out uh, in, in, uh, start playing uh, their way into our discussion. Because if Haskalah in the early phases was seen predominantly in positive light, as something that would help to modernize the Jews, something that would help them to better integrate in the hosting European society, suddenly you will see another streak of ideas uh, emerging in their thinking and in Smolanskin's thinking, in which suddenly the type of Haskalah you find in Berlin, the West European, Central European Haskalah, is actually something we need to avoid, not to follow into this trap. And why is that? By the time Smolanskin is writing his uh, um, uh, um, his um, his pieces, the Haskalah of Berlin, or it is time to plant, you will see a very different view from Eastern Europe of uh, uh, on on Central Europe. Suddenly, the German Jews that are enjoying the fruits of assimilation, of, of emancipation and Ascala are seen as losing their Jewish identity, losing some sort of a, a car, kernel spine. And uh, uh, that the very basic idea of a Jewish or collective, something that in the in the sources often is referred to as Beit Israel, literally the house of Israel, but a sense of a community that despite geographical distances has a clear bounding ideas is cutting, starting to get lost. And suddenly emancipation is seen as coming with uh, a price toll. It has a dark sinister side, which is the assimilation that lose, that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, lot, that in a way uh, fragments this Jewish, uh, Jewish collective. And, and the idea of, of thinkers like Spirits Molanski is sort of a, to find, if you'd like, a golden path, something in between, something that would allow Jews to modernize themselves, uh, open them, their, themselves to uh, modern, modern ideas and erudition coming from non-Jewish sources, but at the same time without kind of losing a sense of, of unity and also not only a unity that is conceived in religious terms. He does not want to see Judaism only as a theologically based a conception that, that unites these different people together. So in a way, you can see a very a clear connection, if you'd like, an ambivalent connection or, or, or what some historians would like to call dialectic tension between, on the one hand, the Smolanskin that admires the Haskalah, but at the same time, a Smolanskin that is uh, pushing himself uh, uh, away from a Berlin-based Haskalah or trying to say there's a different path or a different route to go. Um, and this is in a way, uh, uh, um, um, I am offering you also here, one of the ideas that is connected to a, a, a bigger, you know, another broader tension that, that plays its way into our discussion. And this is, uh, again, um, uh, will appear in the secondary reading that I recommended, uh, that I signed you, um, which is connected to the very uh, traditional uh, society of Eastern Europe that is still very much uh, based on, on an observant community, but observant community which is familiar with ideas that have a very strong messianic tone to them. And in a way, Part of what you see here is also the problem of, uh, or the challenge of any type of Jewish nationalism to emerge in a very religious Jewish background has to do with something that 
again, I need to open here quick brackets, has to do with a classic, if you'd like, Jewish Orthodox, Orthodox, Orthodox uh, approaches uh, toward type uh, ideas of redemption. And to, uh, to, um, uh, to, to kind of try and capture this basic paradox, um, uh, I would define it as uh, in the following in the following way. In, in if you'd like, in Orthodox Judaism or in the Orthodox Jewish tradition, there is a very strong an argument about affirmation of the exile uh, and a tendency that is very much based on on longer patterns of Jewish history to avoid. Uh, uh, falling too quickly into the uh, uh, trap of, of an, a, any desire to see a Messiah coming in your own time. In the, ter in the terms of Jewish theology, those who are uh, imagining the return to Zion, that's of course part of the Jewish prayer that for ages, but to do Act to pursue actively and start doing things in your own life in order to help bring this end uh, into fruition in your own life can be encountered with a very stern religious theological objection that one should not intervene in some sort of a divine plan and when the Lord Almighty will decide to bring the Jews back to the land of Zion, he will do so, but humans are not there to intervene and change a divine, uh, a divine plan. I am simplifying a thesis that is uh, 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 explained it in much uh, greater detail and much better nuance by Aviezer Ravitsky in his book on Messianism, Zionism, and Jewish religious radicalism. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because Part of what you see suddenly emerging in the late 19th century is also a new way of thinking about Messianism in the Jewish, uh, uh, in the Jewish theological uh, realm. And Ravitsky reconstructs this is the orthodoxy's uh, divergent positions toward earlier early ideas of return to Zion, which range from radical condemnation. Uh, to any type of talk about this. So if you'd like, the gr ultra-Orthodox group that is called Neturei Karta exemplifies this opinion on the one hand, and, uh, uh, um, and sometimes uh, um, um, an, an ability to think about redemption in a new way and start saying uh, people, humans, do need to start uh, um, um, actively following, uh, prepare the ground to this kind of a messianic return to the land uh, of Zion. And in a way I'm mentioning it because these type of tensions are not tensions within Zionism, these are tensions within modern Jewish orthodoxy that animate the Jewish or or orthodox, ultra-orthodox world to this day. I've mentioned last time and I will reiterate it again, ultra-orthodoxy, despite its name, is actually a very modern phenomena. And you will see these debates about whether the idea, the national idea of returning to the land of Zion is actually helping to God, God so to speak, to uh, execute his uh, divine plan, or actually the biggest sin ever. And the, um, the group known as Ray Carta, for instance, is a good example of those uh, that would say that the creation of uh, the state of Israel is a sacrilegious uh, movement. This is an interference of the humans in this divine inspired history. And even in, uh, in some cases, they will say Israel is the work of Satan itself. On the, on the other hand, you will see other uh, religious thinkers that are starting to develop a new conception of redemption and a new way of thinking about the return and actively starting to convince Jews to move to the Holy Land of Zion uh, uh, um, um, without uh, forcing the end. The forcing the end was the theological term that was applied against those that should not uh, uh, call uh, to do actively uh, any action 
to uh, to move uh, uh, Jews to to the land of Israel. And this is kind of a this group that sometimes we tend to call them as uh, forerunners of Zionism. If you look at them carefully, especially at figures like the individual you see at the center of this poster here, Rabbi Kalisher, they're actually coming from a very religious background. And these are, they fall under the category of, of what Levitsky would call the redemptionist religious Zionism. And according to this kind of a trajectory, these intellectual mentors that are uh, observant Jews, you will see here the idea that the fulfillment of a biblical vision of redemption can be uh, done in our own lives, in our own days, and we should, you know, uh, start uh, uh, start uh, seeing the uh, uh, um, um, how uh, the, the you know uh, how we're moving towards that direction. Those of you who are familiar, for instance, with the individual at the right uh, lower corner of this poster, Rabbi Cook. Rabbi Cook, in a way, is uh, to a large degree one of the founding fathers of what we would call today the settlement movement in the West Bank. Uh, that is predominantly religious Zionism. So in a way, you can see here that in the mid to late 19th century, within Jewish theology, the idea of whether one should return to the Holy Land, yes or no, and as a redemptionist act uh, is actually a source of a great debate. And within Jewish theology, you have uh, division and, and, uh, and controversy between those who are going and rejecting it as an attempt to intervene in the divine plan uh, um, and those who are willing to accept this uh, uh, idea of uh, redemptionist uh, uh, um, cause. Um, any questions here before I will uh, uh, say a few words about our other secondary reading? Okay, wonderful. Um, so again, the uh, the very term or the concept of forerunners or uh, harbingers or, or precursor, uh, precursors of Zionism is very much associated with the name um, of the historian whose uh, portrait you can see here before you, Jacob Katz. He was uh, um, um, uh, one of the giant of modern Jewish history, himself coming from an Orthodox background, but studied in Germany um, and, uh, with a great sociologist by the name of Karl Mannheim. And he is the one that to start uh, uh, arguing that what you see in the 19th century is the breakdown of what he called traditional society. Um, and he was thinking about it really uh, in the way that sociology were thinking about, uh, um, um, about this term, in which the Jewish communities were starting to uh, uh, fragment and, and with special attention to the changes that were brought by the Haskalah and the Orthodoxy. And in this type of uh, toxic environment, you suddenly see the, uh, uh, the emergence of thought of thinkers like Rabbi Kalisher and others who he started calling uh, proto, uh, proto Zionists. Um, and his, the influence of the thesis to this very day is immense. In a way, one of the reasons that an anthology such as Hertzberg's anthology or the, all the famous textbooks on Zionism will start in, with discussion of figures like Moses has and Kalisher has much to do with the uh, uh, influence of, uh, of um, Jacob Katz's thesis. So this is one of the reasons why I would recommend going back to his uh, articles, reading it, but also reading it critically and thinking not only where he convinces you, but where his theory squeaks. So what I would like to do now is to say a few words briefly about each one of those three key individuals that uh, uh, Jacob Katz highlighted and saw as uh, forerunners of, uh, uh, of Zionism and to situate, situate each in time and place as good and careful historians should. So let's start with Yuda ben Shlomon Chay al Kalai, uh, a Sephardic Jew. Um, he was born in Sarajevo, in 1798, this is a part of what we would call today Bosnia, 
part of what was until the breakdown of the cold uh, of the Soviet Empire, uh, part of that land that we called Yugoslavia. But at his time, of course, part of a much bigger uh, um, uh, empire, namely the Ottoman Empire. But uh, though situated in Europe, it's the Balkan um, and, uh, and so on. Now, I mentioned the fact that he's part, uh, he is a resident or uh, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire because uh, it also means something that might sound banal, might sound trivial, but is important in the context of our discussion. Palestine, the land of the Holy Land is accessible for him. It doesn't need to cross borders, he's traveling within the same Ottoman Empire if he wants to move to Jerusalem, as indeed he did. Uh, he moved to Jerusalem as a child. He studied in Jerusalem, which also belonged to the Ottoman Turkish Empire at the time, of course, uh, under different rabbis and came under the influence of Kabbalah, which is the uh, uh, Jewish mysticist uh, um, uh, theological uh, study. Now, what, what, when Yuda uh, 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 al Kalai is traveling to Palestine, what on earth can he find? Of course, he doesn't have there the Jewish Zionist colonies that would emerge there only after his death when uh, uh, in the influence of the Zionist movement. He will see Jewish communities that are predominantly religious communities, and these Jewish communities live, reside in what was called at the time the four holy cities. What are these four holy cities? You can see this symbolic map in front of you. Jerusalem, Tiberias, Tzephat, Sephad, or and Hebron. And in 1825, when Rabbi Alkali uh, becomes a reader and the teacher of Sephardic community of Semlin uh, and Rabbi uh, um, uh, for later years, he is actually connecting to the areas of today, uh, of to, very close to today's Belgrade, ideas that he was in, uh, in, um, um, exposed to in the Holy Land when studying uh, um, in uh, Jerusalem and meeting uh, the Kabbalist of, of Tzafat. In 1852, suddenly uh, uh, Alkali decides that we need to go beyond simply studying Jewish mysticism. He establishes the society of the settlement of Eretz Israel. This was the name he was using, of course, in uh, London. And in 1871, he visited Jerusalem once again and established another short-lived colonization society. Uh, again, these are his terms. Uh, and in, uh, uh, and in, when he was already in his late 70s, he moved to uh, Jerusalem where, uh, with his wife, uh, where he died uh, um, uh, in 1877 uh, 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 and was uh, buried like so many uh, Jews uh, at the time in the Mount of Olives Jewish Cemetery in the uh, in Jerusalem outside the old city. But of course, the location of his burial site is connected to Jewish theology. This is um, the idea that at the time of redemption, when Messiah will come, all the dead will rise from their grave and they will walk right back into the temple where, that would reemerge in the uh, uh, in the Temple Mount. So Mount Olives, those who are familiar with the geography in Jerusalem would know is just across the valley. This is the shortest commute you will have when Messiah will come back uh, uh, and you will come back from the dead and so on. But apart from his actions and activities, it's not that the societies that he established uh, were huge, a huge success. They of course dwarf in comparison to what would happen when Herzl will establish an organization. Part of what is interesting in thinkers like uh, Alkali is the type of ideas and terms he is using. And to understand how he thinks of return to the Holy Land and what he means by redemption, we must first understand that he is working within a framework of Jewish theology and uses a language that has one important key concept, namely, Teshuva, tshuva. This is, those of you who are coming from a Jewish background probably heard the term. Tshuva literally means in colloquial Hebrew today, simply answer, but actually tshuva has a very deep theological uh, origin. And the term tshuva 
uh, in Hebrew is uh, uh, refers to both return in the literal sense, I am going back uh, to uh, a source, but also can under, uh, be understood as repentance. Uh, and in other words, the idea of repentance as Jewish thought is a return to a path of righteousness. Therefore, if someone is becoming suddenly, is growing up in a secular or non-observant background, but suddenly he decides on to take upon himself uh, um, uh, the rules and the right and becomes a, a yeshiva bucher, and uh, he, we will call him someone who is returning in teshuva. He's returning, uh, repenting uh, uh, back there. And this is a Baal Tshuva in Jewish theological terms. But Alkali is playing as a thinker, the theological thinker, he's playing on the dual meaning of the term Tshuva. And he sees the return both as a return to the path of righteousness and literally as a return to the Holy Land and to the promise uh, promise land of uh, 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 Zion. And if you uh, don't believe me, read carefully the uh, one of the sources I've assigned you to read, The Third Redemption by Rabbi Alkali. We'll read only a very short excerpt from it to, uh, that uh, demonstrates this idea. So I quote from Alkali's uh, text. There are two kinds of return, individual and collective. Individual return means that each man should turn away from his evil personal ways and repent. The, uh, the way of such repentance has been prescribed to devotional books of our religious tradition. This kind of repentance is called individual because it is relative to the particular needs of each man. Collective return means that all Israel should return to the land, which is the inheritance of our fathers, to receive the divine command and to accept the yoke of heaven. This collective return was foretold by the prophets. Even though we are unworthy, heaven will help us for the sake of our holy ancestors. Undoubtedly, other, other great wishes to gather our exiles from for the four corners of earth to become one bond. We are, alas, so scattered and divided today because each Jewish community speaks a different language and uh, uh, different customs. These divisions are an obstacle to the redemption. End of quote. And again, you can read uh, uh, the full text in your anthology. So part of what you will see here is actually a theological redefinition of the idea of redemption or tshuva. Return to Zion, despite, as you can see here, we're not worthy, we are imperfect, we're sinners, um, is possible and permissible, says Rabbi Alkali, because that will be the path to return, a collective religious uh, revival. And of course, the redemption uh, and the messianic times is also described as a type of a national redemption. The Jews that are scattered or four corners of the world will regather again. And the things that divide them, different languages, different customs, uh, uh, if you'd like, even different clothes and diets will disappear as they will become once again one bond. So you see here a very complicated uh, connection between new ways of thinking in theological terms. These are new way, uh, uh, types of Jewish theology and the nationalist ideas. Now, if you compare and contrast him to Rabbi uh, Kalishel Rishat Shilom, uh, you see some similarities, but also some differences. So let's do the same exercise we've done earlier. Again, I always encourage you, whenever you encounter a name or a text, ask yourself the WH question, where, when, what, why. So in the case of Kalisher and his famous text, Derishat Zion, we know the answers very quickly. It was published in 1862 in the city of Frankfurt on the other. Um, but it was published, as you can see carefully, if you can read the German in the uh, slide here, by an organization that is called already the Palestine Settlement so Society, the, which was founded two years earlier. And uh, Kalisha was the one to 
propose not only a new type of idea of return, but actually how to organize this return, to collect money for this purpose from Jews from all over the country, to buy and cultivate land in Palestine, to found an agricultural school even, either in Palestine or actually in some idea, some places says in France that would prepare those who will move to Palestine later on. And even to, to form a Jewish military guard to, that would secure these uh, colonies in Palestine. And this book, the Shach uh, 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 Zion, uh, was published uh, in another, in, in different uh, uh, um, uh, languages. Here you can see it again in the German translation. Um, and, um, uh, and you can definitely see how when Herzl will come to the stage, many of the more observant Jews um, um, don't see his ideas as emerging out of nowhere because they are already familiar with ideas that will advance by Kalischer 20 or 30 years earlier uh, in texts like these. Now, theologically, Kalischer is a coming from a slightly different background from than uh, Alkali that we discussed earlier. Uh, if Alkali was a Sephardi Jew, here we have uh, Ashkenazi Jew, um, and if Alkali was very much influenced by mysticism and the ideas of Jewish theology in the Ottoman lands, including in, in, in Palestine at the time, this is a thinker that is already uh, rubbing shoulders with the thinkers of reform Judaism, but also sometimes fighting against them and so on. And the location of these thinkers is not simply a technical a fact that you need to remember. It is part of understanding where he, their ideas are emerging from. Because Kalishan is born in a classic buffer area. He is coming from Posen, which is a very interesting uh, uh, city that is situated exactly at the meeting point of German nationalists and Polish nationalists. This is a region that was inhabited for generation by a uh, majority of Polish speaking majority, but there were also uh, substantial Jewish minorities and German minorities. And you would not be surprised to hear then for that in an age of rising nationalist sentiments, this will be an area of conflict uh, and division. Almost all the Poles, for instance, in the area that Kalisha was residing were Roman Catholics. The German speaking were predominantly Protestants. And you have here one of those areas that were often described as uh, an impossible area of Kulturkampf, that was a German term for a cultural war. The nationalist uh, rivalry already added only an, another layer of animosity to what was already uh, a linguistic, cultural, and religious uh, uh, attention between these minorities. And the Jews play their way into these uh, div uh, divide. Uh, and it comes and it rises, especially when Prussia becomes more a stronger power in the, uh, uh, in the region and that intensifies um, anti-Polish sentiment and also uses uh, its policies from 1830s onwards to uh, uh, alienate the Jewish, uh, the, excuse me, the Polish nationality. So if you'd like, you have here a German speaking Ashkenazi Jew that is sitting exactly at the theater watching how a rivalry between Polish Roman Catholics and German uh, uh, sp uh, uh, speaking uh, uh, Protestants are fighting over uh, uh, this area. And this leads to very dramatic clashes. We won't go into detail uh, uh, about it, but you can see them. And anyone who will study either German nationalism or Polish history will, will study about these events in detail. Uh, these are the, the events in which you suddenly see also the use of the modern nationalist flags, such as here you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the German tree-colored uh, uh, flag. Um, and this is a uh, uh, very uh, uh, part of the uh, dramatic events of 1848 that in Polish history we'll call them uh, the, uh, the fight, the uprising, the Poznan uprising. This is the biggest uprising during the 1848 war in which not the Germans are um, uh, crying out for freedom, 
but the but the Polish nobility is fighting and trying to uh, 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 to uh, secede and and push away the Prussian German speaking authorities. So here you see Kalischer looking at all of these firsthand and influenced uh, uh, influenced by them. So this is why you can see his him emerging from uh, uh, a different uh, uh, a different society. So he, I would uh, would not go into great detail into the Richardson, but when you're reading this text, please take these type of facts into consideration um, and the, and it sheds lights on the way he has kind of this unflagging effort to advance uh, uh, the idea of, of, of Jewish uh, uh, Jewish return. To conclude, that we'll move to our third speak, uh, uh, forerunner of Zionism, uh, a very interesting uh, figure and a very different type of figure, which is Moses Hess. As I've mentioned in my opening lines, the very name, the very title of his famous book, Roman Jerusalem, already gives you more than a hint as to what was the model he had in mind. He was a German speaking Jew, but he was highly influenced and admired the Italian Risorgimento. What is Risorgimento? That's the, the Italian term for resurgence or revival, in which you see on, not only a fight against Austrian uh, uh, domination and an attempt to unite the Italian uh, boot under one rule and to push away the French, uh, um, uh, the French from some parts of northern Italy to push away the Austrians from other parts uh, 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 and unite uh, uh, the entire Italy into one uh, figure, but also a movement that was very rich with intellectuals such as Giuseppe Mazzini and so much of his uh, writings is actually if you'd like an homage to Mazzini, the father of young Italy. And young Italy is actually in, uh, the background or the subtext of so much of Moses Hesse's ideas. It's if the, our two uh, earlier figures are emerging from a Jewish theological background, it, between the lines of Moses Hesse's um, 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 chapters, you can almost hear uh, uh, Giuseppe Mazzini's ideas, and especially the way he thought about uh, the idea of uniting Italy as in the way, in the words of Mazzini, a brotherhood of Italians who believe in, look at the language, listen to the language as a very classic sort of enlightenment language. Uh, they believe in law of progress and duty, they are convinced that Italy is destined to become one nation. And the project here is a project of uh, pushing uh, uh, the Italians not only from uh, so, uh, servitude to freedom, but that the fight for liberation is also an attempt to modernize the nation. And this modern nation is seen in, in, in the writings of figures like Mazzini and others as, uh, um, as something that has at least three vital elements. Uh, this is the, there's a drive to regenerate it. So there's a, a paradoxical uh, view of progress versus uh, antiquity. You see modern Italy as a uh, regeneration of an older type of uh, Italian spirit or mentality, but not simply as a return. So regeneration, unlike cyclical views of history, is not simply return to the antiquity. And it forges, secondly, a sense of collective mission and national destiny. And of course, uh, the third vital component is a sense of a national authentic uh, authenticity. Uh, so there's something clear about uh, Italianness that is coming out and is expressed here. Now, one of the reasons Moses Hess is so fascinating and so complicated has to do with the fact that he, unlike our 
two uh, other forerunners of Zionism uh, that I've mentioned earlier, not only coming from a non-observant uh, background uh, and from a German uh, quasi-assimilated background, he even plays a very key role in the history of Marxism. He's actually a socialist thinker that is very much influenced by socialist ideas. More than that, he rubs shoulders with no other than the big rabbi, by, me, by which I mean Karl Marx him, uh, 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 himself. And he, so part of what plays into the ideas of uh, Moses says is also the type of Marxist uh, uh, conceptions of history. He is revolting against the Marxist ideas that a revolution, a future revolution would move humankind into a post-nationalist, a universalist stage in which everyone is equal, but he is a strong believer and he would endorse completely the famous saying from Marx's uh, uh, text on the German ideology that if philosopher up to our day had only interpreted the world in various ways from this stage on uh, today, the, uh, what philosophers need to do is to change it. Uh, this famous saying that you can find uh, inscribed on his uh, uh, on his, on his tomb at the High, Highgate Cemetery in in London is uh, is actually part of what is animating uh, animating thinkers like uh, Moses uh, Moses has uh, again. So part of what you you see here is a very interesting uh, move by historians that uh, actually take different thinkers that are coming from very different backgrounds, uh, operating even not exactly at the same time, roughly at the same time, but in very different areas. And you are coupling together all of them to talk about the origins of, ideo of, of Zionist ideology. And I mention it because part of uh, what is so appealing in the idea of the forerunners of Zionism is also part of what so many contemporary thinkers shy away from, if not to use even bolder language, they push against this. Because the very construction here uh, you know, forces people that have a very different background and a very different set of ideas, it, in, it reads onto them, project backwards, some sort of as a sense that they are all working towards a future Zionist ideology that we impose on them uh, that is a bit anachronistic. So in a way, part of what you will see if you will read history of Zionism and will compare older new literature on the subject is that older literature tried to see Zionism predominantly as the study of ideology. And when you're studying ideology, you are looking at these forerunners that are heralds of a new age in which you will find the genesis of these ideas. And the newer literature tends to be more careful and, the, it, afraid, and it, it pushes against the tendency of the older literature to create what is called mythology, you know, mythologies. Uh, you are searching uh, a, a doctrine, some sort of a Zionist doctrine uh, so uh, eagerly that you enforce it on earlier thinkers that not, that not necessarily had these ideas. Not anyone that thought about return to Zion is automatically preparing the stage for Herschel and the Zionist movement. So I'm not answering this question, but I definitely uh, would like to put it and propose it here for you uh, to, to, uh, to see both the, uh, uh, how the idea of foreigners of Zionism can help us, but also why it is slightly uh, problematic. It can easily collapse into a very anachronistic reading of history in which you force the idea of Zionism or proto-Zionism on thinkers that not necessarily had these type of uh, um, um, of ideas in mind. So, you know, by this I end the formal part of the of today's lecture, and and I will open up uh, um, uh, uh, the room for for 
uh, discussion um, uh, for discussion uh, now. Any questions? So what I would like you to do in, in you know, when uh, um, uh, reading the excerpts I've assigned you is, is, uh, um, is to ask yourself exactly the, to, to what extent the very concept, the very idea that we take a thinker that was operating in a time and a place where Zionism was still not, definitely not an organization, but even the concept was not existing, uh, to what extent it helps us to understand his ideas by calling him a proto-Zionist, and to what extent we are shoving ideas up, you know, to his, uh, uh, onto him forcefully, and it's not a very convincing, uh, convincing. Uh